All right, let's go. Um, so, German. Second, and we don't have to wave arms or give thumbs, we can just say aye. Wonderful. Aye. Motion to approve. Second. Motion to approve. All at once. Uh, aye. Thank you. Memories back. We talked about the creek management. That was the primary focus of that meeting. Was our, our recommendation that we um, forwarded okay. to council on creek um, oh, strategies. Okay. That was right. a big one. Before I bullied everybody into meeting and walking the path. <laughs> well, no, it was, it was surely a, it was we might follow, follow up that. meeting. Was it follow up? Yeah, it was after that meeting. Yeah, yeah that's right. It was like a wintry walk. So look at the trail that I've been seeing. Preliminary discussion on the photos. You got it. Yeah, I remember now. Yeah. <laughs> downtown um, and the creek later in the evening than just 5 p.m., especially in the summer months where someone doesn't set until after 8. Um, there's still plenty of, of good creek going activities after that 5 p.m. cutoff. So um, the request from area residents was to eliminate um, the, the time restriction and make it seven days a week. And um, oh, also, the, the initial was Monday through Friday did not include weekends. Obviously, weekends are quite a draw. Um, for both downtown and the creek. So weekends, especially, um, the on-street parking would become quite crowded and um, well, it led to the area residents requesting that we modify it um, to be effective 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and so that's what, that's what this request is. And so um, this will go to council. They ultimately have the say as to how we manage the permanent parking areas, um, but under under, well, under the code adopted for this board, we must assuredly have a voice in um, parking and permit parking specifically. So it made some sense to have a bit of process around this and um, bring it to you guys for a formal recommendation to city council as to whether or not to adopt the modification as, as proposed. Um, I did, when I first brought this to you guys, you wanted some data. I was able to get some of that data, but not all of it. Um, the number of units and number of, of residents within um, individual structures is, is one that I don't readily have access to and did not get. Um, also did not do a formal parking utilization study. Did observe it at times, and um, yes, it's quite busy on the weekends. Quite busy on weekday evenings as well. I, I suppose that I get the, the request. Um, I, I suppose if I were living in one of these residences, then I would make that request as well. Um, so 
within this area, and we're talking very specifically about the red area on the map only, um, it's primarily residences. There is one non-residence, which is a church. I believe it's your church, Daisy. <laughs> Um, it, it fronts one um, leg of, of um, one of the frontages marked in red. Um, outside of that, it is, it is strictly residential, um, kind of a mostly single family homes, um, some uh, apartments or, or row houses, townhomes, if you will, um, but primarily single family homes. Um, I did go through and kind of make an observation as to what whether or not these individual lots had available off-street parking in either a garage or um, just a, a service spot. Um, I've sort of summarized that below. A lot of them do, and I did not get into a lot of, there are some garages that probably would not fit, um, certainly would not fit my vehicle, um, would probably struggle to fit most modern vehicles, um, more of a shed, but I didn't really get into that. If it looked like a garage and quacked like a garage, I called it a garage, um, and therefore called it an off-street parking space. But that's summarized there for you. Um, we also did some surveys. Um, did a mailing to the permit holders and basically just asked very simply, do you or do you not support this change? And after giving them a bit of background, um, did the same thing for area users in the form of flyers with a QR code that they could scan and basically answer that that same question. Um, also asked sort of, you know, how often they use it, where they live in proximity to it, not terribly pertinent to the discussion. Um, I can pull up that, the data, if, if we want to see raw data, but I've sort of summarized it here. Um, not surprisingly, the permanent area residents um, largely are in favor of, of the request to change, and also not surprisingly, the area users are not so in favor of that change. Um, so that I, I can certainly answer any questions, um, but that is the background and the nature of the request to change. And if there are no questions, we can move on to public comment. We can do questions after public comment. Um, I sort of put survey data after public comment. I'm not sure why I did that. Um, but there you have it summarized. Um, and I can pull it up um, the raw form if it's at all helpful to read through. Some of them, some of the answers were, it was very clearly a yes or no question. Um, but some of the answers were not um, yes or no, and they were quite lengthy, and some of them were difficult to determine if you, they ultimately fell to a yes or to a no. Um, so I kind of, I, I, I put them in their own category. Uh, Is that as, an unclear preference? Unclear <laughs> preference. <laughs> um, so, yeah. but. Do you have an idea of who area parking users are? I'm assuming that they're mostly students or a lot of students, so, so the flyers went to um, uh, Golden City Brewery, which is directly adjacent to um, this area on Cheyenne, um, and also got posted in some of the buildings directly adjacent, well, well nearby this area and in, um, in the campus. Um, I feel like the campus flyers got kind of removed from the board, I'm not real sure why, um, but um, so I, I would assume that most of the responses came from GCD patrons, um, but that is most assuredly. I have some thoughts, but I can wait until after public comment. All right. Anybody else? We should do public comment first. All right. So, do you want me to read the emails first? Yeah, and then we'll you, oh, yeah, sure. So, three emails. Uh, first one comes from Heather Burton. Hello, Mr. Poor. We have lived at 1011 12th Street since 2004. We've seen a lot of changes in our little neighborhood, some exciting and for the best, others less so. Unfortunately, it has become harder and harder to find a parking space anywhere near our home. Sometimes it is a bigger problem than others, such as when we have a car full of groceries to empty. On summer weekends, we often worry about leaving our car, knowing that when we, that when we will return, we, there will not be a place to park. We will just absolutely. We would just absolutely love to have the permit hours extended to 24/7. I am working tomorrow and will not be at the town meeting, but want to express our support. My husband and two daughters all agree. Thank you for all that you do for us, and you take care, Heather. And it's the first one. Now, the second one comes from Katie. 
I'm going to butcher this. Kalkar? Kepka? Yep. Um, hello, Joe. My name is Katie, that last name. I'm a homeowner on 11th Street, and I'd like to express my support for expanding permit hours on 12th Street for the MTAD meeting this e evening. While 11th Street has different parking rules, I'm affected by the parking permit situation on 12th Street because in my 12th Street neighbors are unable to find street parking due to the large volume of visitors outside permit hours. They're forced to find parking in our alley in unofficial spaces. I also feel residents of 12th Street should have precedence to park in front of their homes and visitors be encouraged to park in nearby public parking areas. Additionally, we struggle in the neighborhood with parking enforcement where cars are allowed to park directly up to the end of the corner. This is particularly dangerous in the intersection of 12th and Cheyenne, which is a four-way intersection with no stop sign. It's already a dangerous corner, but when cars park to the end of the corner, there's no visibility to oncoming traffic. Traffic without pulling into the intersection itself. Can stop signs be installed at this intersection? Cars restricted from parking illegally. Thanks in advance for sharing my feedback at the meeting. I'm out of town and unable to attend the meeting in person. Thanks also to you and the Intel board for your service to our city. Kind regards, Katie Kafka. Last one is from Patty Evans. Hi Joe, can you please pass this along to the MTAB members in advance of the meeting? I failed to do that, apologies. Um, and there will be, and will there be a review? Okay, let's skip that. Hello MTAB members, I want to weigh in on the 12th Street permit parking discussion. So, several neighbors and I have been talking with Joe about this since last July, and I watched your meeting in January, January when, this topic of when this was a topic of discussion. A few comments regarding your questions and comments in the January meeting. To clarify, this is a residential neighborhood, not a mixed-use area. We shouldn't confuse the issue by referring to a residential neighborhood as anything but that. Additionally, residential areas were never intended to be overflow parking for commercial businesses. One board member mentioned wanting to know the difference on impacts from individual homes. For example, a family with two cars versus students with five cars. To be clear, the challenge is not an impact from 12th Street neighborhood residents CSM students or not, the impact is from visitors coming to downtown businesses or the creek on evenings and weekends. The reason we know that that is because on an evening with bad weather or a weekend or winter weekend, parking is never overcrowded. Residents will be home and using the street during those times, but visitors won't. There is adequate parking to support the residents who live here, but not the businesses that are adjacent to our residential neighborhood. I strongly support the pro proposal to expand permit parking hours. I've lived in this neighborhood since before the existing permit parking went into effect and have seen the positive effects of having this policy. The existing permit program during the weekdays works well. The enforcement is good, and the benefit to our neighborhood compared to a decade ago is dramatic. However, that is the case only during the permit hours. Over the last few years, we have been getting a lot of overflow traffic from downtown businesses and creek visitors during evenings and weekends. This results in many residents unable to park anywhere near their homes. If they leave on a weekend day, then tourists taking up every parking spot available, every street parking spot available. On every summer weekend and most evenings, our streets full of visitors. This is a historic neighborhood and many lots were platted in the mid to late 1800s hundreds before cars. Some of my neighbors have no off-street parking or alley access, and some have off-street garages, in quotes, that are insufficient for modern vehicles, particularly when they need to walk up bicycles in those tiny garages to prevent theft. Being in a car on weekends or busy evenings can sometimes be a gamble on whether they can park within the entire neighborhood afterwards, causing a hassle to families with small children or elderly family members. This is an inconvenience of not being able to park anywhere near our homes, but there's also a major safety issue we see evenings and weekends that isn't there during the weekdays. Visitors disregard parking laws, consistently parking too close to corners, blocking sight lines, blocking curb cuts, and blocking driveways and alleys. I live on the corner of 12th and Cheyenne. On any given weekend, there are consistently four plus cars parked illegally close to that intersection, sometimes blocking the fire hydrant outside of Pangea. Our driveway and alley are frequently blocked or have a car parked right up to the edge even though the law is five feet from the driveway or alley. This is repeated throughout the neighborhood at every intersection. All this contributes to an unsafe environment for both pedestrians and cars since seeing around the illegally parked cars is impossible. Additionally, because drivers are using the residential street, holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I wanted you to send it to them in advance. Yeah, 
Yeah, I get that would have been way smarter. <laughs> Additionally, because drivers are using the residential streets in search of parking, they are often driving erratically and distracted, stopping and starting suddenly, rolling through stop signs, flipping U-turns, all of these distracted driving behaviors increase the dangers for pedestrians and bikers. We've tried to address the illegal parking through enforcement for years. We frequently call the non-emergency police line to report cars blocking fire hydrants parked illegally, blocking sight lines, driveways, alleys, and curb cuts, speeding, running stop signs, etc. Usually dispatch will tell us that nobody will respond because they're all busy. Occasionally we'll get assurance that someone will come out, but that is rarely the case. This infrequent enforcement does little to change behavior. All this to say we have tried to handle this through enforcement alone for years, but have had no success, and the exist existing process is just not working. A few weeks ago, someone parked inches away from the alley on our street. I told them that the law is five feet from alleys, driveways, or sight lines. Their response was, it's okay, the police told me they don't enforce that law. <laughs> um, yeah. um, we hear from staff that there's always plenty of public parking available in downtown garages. If that's the case, there's an easy solution here. Extend our neighborhood permit hour and direct commercial and creek traffic to the available public parking lots. This isn't without precedent. There are a lot of neighborhoods throughout the city that have permit hours at the times that the neighborhood is most impacted. By the high school, by the Lula Trail, and Ninth Street District, and other neighborhoods by CSM. 10 plus years ago, our peak impact times were when CSM was in session. That impact was solved by implementing the permit system we have now. Over the years, our impact times have extended into evenings and weekends as downtown and the creek have become tourist destinations. This will likely worsen as Miners Alley Playhouse moves into the old Meyer Hardware building and Foothills Arts Center extends into the Astor House. We live in a residential neighborhood that has gotten much less quiet in the past several years. While well, extended parking permit hours won't solve all the problems, litter in our yard, people, wow. People urinating on our bushes, broken glass on our sidewalks, trespassing across our yards. Hopefully it would go a little further in drawing the distinction between the commercial downtown and the residential neighborhood. Thank you for your service on Intel, and thank you for your consideration on this matter. Thanks, Patty Evans. All right. Sorry. No, you're good. I'll have to say. I, you, you specifically requested this in the blue days, and now I really regret that I didn't see that. <laughs> Come on back. Thank you. Um, here? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Appreciate you guys listening tonight. Um, I also I serve on the planning commission, so I understand like the commitment of the evening meetings, and I appreciate your, your service to the city. Um, so I'm here tonight on behalf of a whole bunch of neighbors who you know, feel strongly but can't be here in person. Um, and to be clear, like you know, I personally have a two-car garage, two-car driveway. I my, the parking for my family and my visitors will not change to so many of this. However, it's a larger systemic issue, it's a neighborhood issue, it's it's quality of life for, for my neighbors and for us. Um, that it's, you'll notice in my letter, I said multiple times, neighborhood, uh, residential neighborhood. And this is, that's what it is. This is a residential neighborhood. This is not a destination where these people are trying to go. They are trying to go downtown on the creek. They are using our neighborhood as a parking lot. Um, it was not designed that. It was not intended to be for that. So the character of our neighborhood changes evenings and weekends when we have a lot of people driving around, flipping new turns, not paying attention to where they're going and what they're doing, and taking the street parking. And because of limited enforcement, they know there's no tickets, so they're going to park illegally, they're going to park close to corners and park dangerously. Um, again, like we have a lot of, we have a lot of impacts from, from the downtown and from, from the creek that have gotten a lot worse in the last several years. We, I recognize we live in a very desirable neighborhood. I'm not complaining about where we live, but it is still a residential neighborhood. It is where we live, where our children live, where we like to, you know, we spend a lot of time outside in our yards, in our front porches, um, having cars speed up and down the street or, you know, go back and forth looking for parking it is, it's a safety issue and it's a quality of life issue. Um, so I don't want you to hear that, hear from us that we're saying, you know, we don't like people, we don't like visitors. What, I, what we're saying is there is a solution to the parking issue and to the quality of life issue. And nowhere else in the city is the residential neighborhood expected to act as a parking lot for the area businesses. So what we're asking for is, you know, something that's been granted to a lot of other neighborhoods, which is, you know, some permit parking hours, so that our residential neighborhood can feel a little more like a neighborhood. 
neighborhood instead of like an extension of downtown, which it was, it's not and was never intended to be. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I did get a ticket there, so I'll do two. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> But I thought they were just it was somebody enforcing it was something. Yes. Well, and so the the what um, what I will say is like the parking the permit enforcement during permit hours is fantastic. Like they do a very good job of enforcing that. What they don't do is you know cars too close to corners and blocking sight lines and you know, all of that, which happens primarily in these weekends. Um, so for my you know extension of it, like if it works so well during permit hours, then what we need to do is extend the permit hours and provide that safe area, like the, the, the safety that should come with the residential neighborhood. And, you know, it's not, it's not the kind of residential neighborhood where our kids can, you know, ride a bike and pull stuff, everything like that. But what we want them to be able to do is cross the street safely and be able to see, um, see sight lines as the engineering intends. Um, and that has been, I don't know, totally solved during permit hours, but it's much, much better a much safer environment during those times. I have two questions. And one probably will be answered by you. The first question is with respect to enforcement. We just heard that someone's received the tickets, so we know it occurs. Who, who does the enforcement? Is it the Rangers or the PD? PD. Okay. Specifically parking enforcement. Okay. So, so. Okay. Yeah, I understand. Based on the letter that you wrote, I infer that you are saying at times you feel trapped in that you would prefer to go somewhere and do something, leave, but may not, perhaps not you because you do have a garage, et cetera, but that some of your neighbors would, would forego leaving or doing something else because when they clearly know when they come back, parking is a crapshoot. Yes. Is that a fair statement? Not for me personally, but yes, I have several neighbors that, you know, kind of look outside and think, okay, do I have time in the grocery store? Or I have to go get my kid from another arm in soccer practice. And, you know, they'll, sometimes they can park within a block of their house, and sometimes it's the entire neighborhood's fault. Um, they use our driver sometimes. <laughs> um, so, but yes, that is absolutely, that is absolutely a fair, a fair point. And, you know, people will have to plan their, and a day around, um, and then their errands around when they can get in park and they come back. And if it's, if it's a weekend where there's a school nice football game or there's um, it's a nice summer weekend at the creek, um, then a lot of our neighbors either won't leave or they'll leave and not plan to come back until the evening. Yeah. Um, and, you know, to, uh, a lot of our, so within, you know, half a block of my house, there are I have probably five or six neighbors that don't have adequate off street parking. Like, either it looks like a garage, but it's, they will not fit a car in it. Um, so, there are, so it's not quite as simple as saying, well, they just you know, park in their own, in the, in the parking lot that they're supposed to have. Because a lot of times these, like these houses were out of year, like decades ago, a century ago, and um, they don't have, it was not designed for modern cars. And in a very, you know, in, a, in a town like Addressing what some of my neighbors do, like, of course, like get on their bikes and go to the bike store or do whatever they need to do on bikes, but they also need a place to walk on their bikes. And so, if they have a smallish garage that would fit either one car or, you know, four expensive bikes for the family, they're going to have their bikes in there because they're more likely to get stolen. So, those are the kind of trade offs that people think about and, um, and, and consider in what they do with their time. We've seen historically with permit areas is, is when you do implement one, there is a distance that people are willing to walk. So we may chase a bit. We may squeeze the balloon here, have it become an issue in other neighborhoods. This area is a bit different. It's the limits of what we're talking about, it's kind of surrounded by campus, so that may not be as big a concern. And maybe that's even appropriate um, for this neighborhood. If, if it squeezes into campus on weekends, then great. That's that's not a problem. Um, that's uh, probably an area of on 
street parking, if it's allowed, that's not heavily utilized on, on the weekends. Um, evenings, I'm unsure. Um, but that's, I mean, that's what we've seen historically when we start to implement these things. Um, we just sort of squeeze the balloon and move it somewhere else. Can I address this? Yeah, sure. So, um, I was here before they implemented the parking, per permit parking that was at the same place now, and that was essentially because of school nights. School nights students were parked in their neighborhood, and in the discussions the city was having with mines, mines continuously complained that there was no parking problem. And as soon as the city instituted the parking, the permit to park in our area, they, within six months, started plans for their parking garage on campus. So it made them have to deal with the problem that they created. So that's kind of, that's what we're going after now, is we didn't create this problem. Um, it's not our job to fix it, but we are dealing with it at the moment. And by expanding the hours here, it's pushing the problem, hopefully downtown, which is where it should be, because there's adequate parking in the garages, which we get all the time, and um, that's where the impact is, or that's where, that's where people should be. Uh, if they're going to GCB or go down to the creek, then drive them to downtown and then have people walk from there. That's that's the obvious solution. Yeah, and don't we hear all the time also that the um, the garage, specifically the one by Ann Leaves, is like way underutilized? It seems um, like maybe people don't know about that one as much or something. Like, yes. specifically tourists don't know that that garage is like Yes, we, we have heard that um, a lot. Uh, I, would, I would attest to that being true. We are studying that presently and should have um, uh, some form a formalized study that will um, indicate just that um, and sort of point of need for us to do a better job of wayfinding and getting people to the place that they are. That's what I was going to say. Especially with um, the Venture West over there. I mean, I don't know where people park to go to Maine. Do they park? Is this affecting the yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We have people like park outside our house and sit on our lawn and blow up our juice. And, oh, and then leave their beer cans there. Oh, yeah. and, oh. and so a bit of a solution on that front for this season is that you know we, we the city purchased the, the lots, the quarters lots, the building and as mm -hmm. well as um, some surface parking lots and for the plan for this summer is just to do our best to direct creek goers um, to those surface lots. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there is available parking other than um, this neighborhood for those activities. Yeah. I think that would, be my, that would be my suggestion is to just like, you know, I know we always talk so much about the signs everywhere, you know, like we don't need more signs, but to get people to utilize those lots over on the east side of town. I'm all for wayfinding. If, yeah. it, if, it, if it keeps people from meandering around neighborhoods and basically driving slow and erratically um, because they're unsure of where they can park, um, then we find it a very good idea. Um, I have a couple of points to make on the comments. So um, I, you may have noticed I paused when um, Katie Kapka said that 12th and Cheyenne is an uncontrolled intersection. That is not the case, and I was very concerned that it was. It is two-way stop controlled, um, so uh, that, that freaked me out. Uh, and I, I, I knew that it couldn't possibly be true, but I, I definitely paused for a moment. Um, the other points I wanted to make is that we, we have started rolling out signage at every intersection, kind of informing drivers of the rule that they ought to know anyways, but you're not supposed to park within 25 feet of a, a crosswalk. I hang my hat, and my interpretation of the model, this is all from the model traffic code, my interpretation of the model traffic code um, is that um, there is an unmarked crosswalk at every intersection of every street. So you can't park within 25 feet of that, um, specifically the, the sidewalk crossing. Um, so we've, we've started rolling out signage in this neighborhood, in 8th Street, and hopefully it will help. Um, I, I think a lot of the people that park too close to intersections are simply ignorant of that rule. Um, obviously there are some that are just unwilling to follow any of the rules or read signs at all. Um, so it, it helps, it's probably not a silver bullet for that issue of too close to intersection. Um, I don't know that point of view is me. While you think about that, I have one more question. Go. Which is that, um, how, well, maybe, I don't know who this is a question for. How does the church parking affect the neighborhood? And they have, they they have, have a garage. garage. They've got a garage. Yeah. 
So the parking for the church isn't wouldn't really be affected by this twenty four seven. I don't. I don't believe so. Dixie, you may be able to answer that better than I. Church closures are not public. Oh, okay. Even for the temple parish, it would have been possible. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. That's never. That's not the issue. Okay. And it wouldn't like the church goers wouldn't be like not inconvenienced at all. Most people won't walk that far. Mm -hmm. Oh right. Yeah, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. Originally, the garage was intended to be open like during the week and on church functions. I think it is. Yeah. I, I, believe it is. I, I, it don't, is. I don't know that I that's It's not very well publicized, though, because I think that is the other garage that sits empty all the time. That's cute. You've got, like, the best kept secret. You've got a parking space in there. So <laughs> wayfinding to the church parking lot. Got it. <laughs> well, now, I, have a, I have a question. I it's a sort of related. Okay. The new Mines parking garage on Maple. Yep. Is that open to the public? I don't believe so. No. Never? I don't Never know that it is. Intended. Steve doesn't know either. I, I don't believe that it is, but I, I certainly don't know. If they would open that to public on evenings and weekends. There, there is public. I have my impression from being up there. You can go pay to park there. Anytime. It's not it's not free parking, it, it, but it's oh, a visitor. Sure. Well, it's a weekend and you want to pay okay. five bucks yeah, or whatever. Yeah, I, 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 I know you can pay to park there. Yeah. That's not, that's that's not, not, it's, not, it's not restricted parking. In Sense that you don't you have to have a parking permit. Okay. All right. You want to pay you want to pay whatever the fee is for when you want to park there? You can go park there. That's well, the, that would be the easy way for mines to contribute. And now that you have in mines, Jason. Cool. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> that guy? Yeah, no, for sure. To, uh, I, I Getting their permission to spread that word that it is an unavailable option. It's, it's pay to park, but it, it is an option. And I think it certainly doesn't hurt this situation or any of the other parking issues around. I think it's revenue on weekends that are not used to. Right. Yeah. So. Well, yeah, pay to park is something that's available. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
there are even children running around with their bare feet. Um, that is, there's a, there's a lie in there, and mm -hmm. you know, people are going to walk down the street and take pictures, and that's that's what we love about living in Bakhti. Um, you can do without without the litter and the, the trash and the over the over intensive use of the neighborhood, the residential. I have a couple other questions about just the residential parking uh, permit system in general, but I don't know if we're still in public comment or if we're well, we kind of into I think we can close that. study sure. session. Mm -hmm. You can stay and then I'll answer the question. Yeah. 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 Conversation. Don't mind at all. I don't think anyone else does. <laughs> Not at all. Go for it. Oh, well, my wow. questions were uh, the last time I had residential parking permit when I lived there about high school. Two per residence, regardless of how many drivers, cars, we okay. had, had two. Uh, I don't know if that's still the case. Or uh, I'm, I'm thinking about just like the changes, you know, you had to pay a certain amount of money every year, you got your two permits. And Rick lives in a similar neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where do you live? I live on 9th Street. We're allowed to have one permit for every vehicle we own. Okay. If I own 10 vehicles, I could have 10 permits. Mm -hmm. Do you pay like an annual fee or is it just part There's of no living fee. in the neighborhood? It's part of living in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And is that currently the case for all the residential parking permits? There's no, no fee? In I don't believe that there's any fee for any of them. Okay. So, so you're paying my land. You have 10 students living in your house. <laughs> <laughs> You could have, they could each other. That's its own set of problems. I know. I know. But yes. But yes, you could do that. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a flaw in the system, so to speak, but it is there. Mm -hmm. But it could be amended at some point. Sure, it could. Sure. Do you have two questions? Um, well, that was the two of them. Oh, okay. Was, was there a fee and was there a limit on a household? Sounds like those were just issues in the lease that I signed. <laughs> <laughs> that was a, a landlord situation. Yeah. Anything else? Or do we, does somebody want to make a motion? Um, I, and I, for the purposes of this, I think um, we should simply make a motion to either recommend the, mo the proposed modification as is um, or not. If we decide that we don't want to, but we want to tweak it, we should do that perhaps at a later time. I think we should. I'll make a motion to approve it as written. I second. Okay. All in favor, favor say aye. 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 This issue with nothing else. <coughs> All right, it was the easiest decision we ever made. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate your time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for all your service to the city, Patty. <laughs> thank you, Patty. The planning commission. It was a lot of work. Um, that was Grubin second? I think I second. Yeah, Teresa. Oh, yeah. Thank Teresa. you. I got so used to doing the um, remote meetings. Oh, with you, all the phones everywhere? Well, not just that, but <laughs> the, the lack of oh. having to do any of this. So I, I got in here today to like, set the meeting up, and I had forgotten completely how to do it the old style. Um, <laughs> including my notes, obviously. Well, we got the vote recorded. We got a vote recorded, and, and we're, all, um, we're, all, we're all present. The rest of the meeting was uh, fluff. <laughs> and I'm a really good lip reader, so I'll just fill it in. <laughs> All right, um, discussion on federal grant funding opportunities, and with us this evening is the esteemed Mr. Blake. Take it away. Sam. Good evening. <laughs> so I feel compelled sometimes at meetings to explain why I still work here. <laughs> <laughs> but, it is a little confusing. It sort of is. So for those who I don't know, um, for about 30 years, I was the director of, used to be called planning and development, then it was community and economic development. Um, and it seemed to be time. And since I left, the police chief also, he totally left, and the public works director totally left. And so there was a new director of public works and a new director of community and economic development. 
Um, and I and my associate Robin, who is the economic development manager, she and I work with Urban Renewal. But even though Urban Renewal is a joint funder for one of these projects, I'm not here in that with that hat. I'm here because Ann Byerly and Rick Burnaby, um, I said, do you need me to help you with dealing with federal funding for this year? And they said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, one, so there's two purposes of this conversation, if it's OK, to, to um, inform you about the craziness of seeking federal funding for transportation projects in a little bit, because we have not come to you before with this. The last time we applied for projects was in 2019, and that's when we got the funding uh, not enough, but for West Colfax and Peach Street and for the design of the Sixth and Heritage Interchange, which we don't have construction money for, but it's under design. Um, the design and management of those projects happens um, by joke um, in the Public Works Department, but dealing with the Denver Regional Council of Governments, um, or in the olden days, um, for those of you who would remember them. Um, Dan Harmon, the public works director, dealt with what I called the big road. This was the Beltway fight for 20, 30 years. And I dealt with RTD and Denver Regional Council of Governments, which made me be the one who would go seek money from them. Um, and so um, the last time we did that, as I said, was in 2019. And we um, successfully um, I'll go through some of the stuff in the memo about how it's changed. We successfully secured um, a $7 million project. It's easier to talk about the gross project, and then you have the local match in it. $7 million project for Colfax and a $3 million design project for Six and Heritage uh, with 20% local match. Uh, and then we went back for more. So it's OK. I want to totally confuse you with these crazy charts from the Denver Regional Council of Governments and a little bit of history. Um, the, even if it's not stated in your enabling ordinance, it would make sense, in addition for you to you and your staff and Planning Commission and their staff to work together on what transportation projects um, are high priority for the community, to be aware of when we're out seeking money from generally the feds, sometimes from CDOT. They don't always match. The priorities don't always match because um, you, you apply for what you can get funded, not necessarily what's your highest priority. It needs to be a high priority, but there are some, some local priorities that we have that just aren't fundable. So anyhow, it's all sorts of ridiculous acronyms, um, um, some of which I just threw in just to, to make it worse. <laughs> like, but, oh, and when you move to Colorado, um, if you're in local government, uh, within the first few months or something, you have to ask, who is this Dr. Todd guy? Why does he have anything? So the Denver Regional Council of Governments is a member organization of about 40 cities and seven counties and the lots of cities um, in the seven county area. But they are also, by, by federal designation, our Metropolitan Planning Organization, or MPO which has a specific role in doling out federal transportation money, both from the Federal Transit Authority, FTA, and the Federal Highway Administration, FHWA. So Dr. Cog is important in this process. And over the years, we've, we've gotten um, some, and we've gotten better at it. But you might not know, the, the trail from the county building down to Clear Creek was funded through this process. That was the first grant that, that I got from them. Um, the trail on the south side of the creek, by the way, was funded by the state from an energy impact grant related to the old Colorado School of Mines Research Industry uh, Institute. Institute that was where the ball fields now are. Um, but the bridge, the bridge over 6th Avenue at the lead rail station, um, or the first flex call and ride bus um, to deal with RTD back when they had any money at all, the only way you really got things done was to fund them for a couple years and then show that they work and then make them take it over, which they did until pandemic time, and then they cut back to flex and run. Mm -hmm. But um, Washington Avenue from State Highway 58 North got funded through that program. And then currently we have funding for West Colfax, which hasn't started construction, 
and, and there's lots of sad story about why <laughs> the other one. But there's been a big change recently is that, um, and if you could imagine trying to refer um, 40 some different jurisdictions, all of which are jealous of each other and think that everyone else is getting all the money. And most of us always thought that Denver and Boulder um, got all the money. Um, the system where we all applied for one big pie, pot of money was very unpopular for the um, outlying communities within Denver, uh, Dr. Cog area. And so there was kind of a um, palace coup, just um, so to speak. And we ended up with this new system where there's a small regional pot, but most of the money actually goes into sub-regional. And um, so we're only competing for the sub-regional on some of those slides with Jefferson County jurisdictions. Um, and it, I believe it has made it better for us to compete. And it's also why I want to try to submit some this year. So that's kind of the process is you, you submit. Normally there's um, a 20% match. Um, and if, if, if you have them on your computer or a hard copy, um, I want to talk about these four slides for a minute. Um, normally they know about how much money they have for, for some, they can predict for many years in the future, and it's not exact, but it's pretty close. But um, sometimes extra things happen, such as the 6th and 19th intersect interchange was built totally outside of this process. Uh, CDOT had a, um, a separate program because they had some extra money for shovel-ready projects, and we still had to do a match, but it wasn't part of this. So this, this is not at all normal that there are what they call four calls for projects this year, totaling First slide, so the total for all of them is $455 million over the period of 22 to 27, which sounds like a lot, but by the time it gets broken down. Uh, regional call one had 40 million, and regional sub-regional call two, which is what we're talking about, has 155 million, and it's divided up into the counties. And so Jeffco has 25 million six hundred twenty-three thousand dollars available to program. What's different, and this is the, the craziest acronym stuff, is most of the money, and that shows up on another page, but most of the money for this current springtime call for projects is the stuff called AQ, which is air quality, and MM, which is multimodal. You cannot apply for things like new roads, roadway widening, interchanges, um, freight, you know, freight overpasses, things like that. Those are considered capacity. So, um, so the 25 million that Jeffco has to go out, and essentially it is, as long as we uh, approve projects that Dr. Cox says are eligible, um, and we do a reasonable, you know, a defensible ranking system, um, the, the Dr. Cog board down in Denver doesn't really mess with um, with our choices. So it's just among us guys what we fund. Um, not related to the rest of tonight's discussion, but um, calls three and four are more normal calls. Um, and there's a different type of money called STBG, which is Surface Transportation Block Grant. That's the building roads money. And you'll see that there's some of that in calls three and four, and there may be a conversation about trying to get funding for Sixth and Heritage. Um, the big, there's two big problems with getting money funding for Sixth and Heritage. One is that if you look at, and it's probably, um, if you include the wildlife crossing that CDOT wants to see built, it's about $60 million. Um, if it's just Sixth and Heritage, it's about 45-ish. Uh, Jeffco only has 34 total in call four, and the region only has 52 total in call three. So um, it will be really, really hard to try to get that funding. But the other part is, I don't know that the city has $12 million as 20% of $60 million, even if CDOT helps us with the, the wildlife crossing. Mm -hmm. 
our CI capital improvement program that you'll probably have some conversations about sometime this summer or fall. Doesn't have that kind of money. However, um, oh, and so Joe and and Byerly, um, periodically, and it's 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 you know it's, if anyone ever has figured out the federal government, let us know. Um, <laughs> They have these other stuff that comes up. Um, the, the, a different version, no, it's not the, I was going to say it's a different version of what did 6th and 19th, but no, that was a state version. Um, the federal government has all of these things that come out um, to stimulate the economy and for all sorts of other reasons, and they're really, really, really competitive. Like, we've applied three times for 6th and Heritage, I think, and um, we probably applied for 6th and 19th a couple times, and we almost never get them. So, that will be a big question. Um, the rest of those are just detailed. So that's a really quick version of um, the type of money that can be available for projects um, of all types, we call it three and four, but not as much, and more bike, pad, complete street, multimodal, congestion management, air quality in call, call two, which is due June 24th, in order to talk to City Council on June 14th, I needed to come visit you tonight. So, Colfax. Um, for those of you, we made the same mistake with Colfax that we made with Washington. We designed a cost estimate for of the grant to Dr. Card based on a fairly modest not bare bones, but pretty modest project. And you might remember that the end up ending project was quite a bit more, and it ended up we had to delete some things. We didn't do it in the roundabout at Iowa, in part because of right away. But um, the city had to decide whether to fund the difference. So the same thing happened again, and I, we even um, inflated our. $7 million estimate for the project back in 2019 as much as we thought we could justify. But because of a concurrent evaluation of the Luna Gulch floodplain, which um, it's a big gulch from, from it's what's called Gateway Village, where the Avalanche Harley is and the Oregon Hotel. From there down to Heritage Road, it's a pretty big gulch. And then it is a totally undersized gulch and some really, really undersized pipes through the Golden Terrace mobile home community. And it doesn't become a real channel until you get past 470. And then it curves north by the um, CDOT maintenance office there. Um, our separate floodplain evaluation is showing that the floodplain is worse than then as mapped by FEMA and the used to be urban drainage. Um, now called Mile High. The impacts are worse. Um, there's overtopping all up and down um, US Highway 40, which CDOT will, doesn't, will not want us to build a project and not fix that. So there's a lot of retaining walls. The preliminary design that we've shown you, um, which are sort of 30% plans, shows a roundabout at Heritage Road and also one at um, Rooney. The one at Heritage Road probably has retaining walls on the hogback side, um, kind of just to the west of Wrigley's there. Um, so we have major inflation that is driving all of us personally crazy. Uh, we have drainage impacts that we didn't know about. We also have a much nicer project than we talked about by having, um, oh, and I, after the fact, I don't have it in my memo because it was after I sent it. I asked Joe to put it in the photo. Um, when I was asking for some additional money for this, I went out there one day, and within a, like 30 seconds, I saw this bike um, almost getting hit by the gravel truck going up the road. Um, we are proposing um, separated bike lanes on the road, um, probably curved, you know, not the bigger case, but probably um, curved separated um, bike lanes for on-road. And then, of course, the, the multi-purpose trail west of Lena Gulch from Heritage Road up to the top. And the, um, the designers, David Evans and Associates, and it's Joe's project. If you want to talk design, you might schedule that a different night once we figure out a little bit more. Um, but 
Her, her estimate is, is about double. Her first <laughs> estimate. And we do have some negotiating between the drainage project and the road project. But we will not achieve what the community um, has asked for. We haven't been shopping these plans out very much because of the, during the pandemic, we had um, virtual meetings for South Neighborhoods Plan and for this and got people's desires. And what they want is they want, they want to accommodate vehicular traffic and they want safe biking and pedestrian facilities. Um, so we, don't we go. So the line of that is that, oh, and when you go and get these grants, they always tell you that if, if the costs are higher, you can't come back for more money, but everyone always does. Um, the classic example is there's a Wadsworth, big Wadsworth project in Wheat Ridge in Arvada that they come back every single time needing more money because mm -hmm. you just don't know the scope until you get into design. Mm -hmm. So staff's proposal to um, the city and urban renewal who split the local match is that we go back and ask for about five million more in um, federal funding. The, um, because of the Lee and Delta project, it would be for a phase from about Zeta Street which is right at Wrigley's East, to the east end of it, at um, just past 470 at Violet Street. And because the Lena Gulch project may end up including some pipe work under Colfax that we don't know yet. So until that project is designed, we, we don't really know. So it will probably get built in two phases. And um, part of the art is how much local mesh can we afford? And that, in part, relates to the fact that even though it's normally always 20%, we don't know if there might be 10% for these type of projects. I'll find out that next week. Because this um, big chunk of air quality multimodal money is COVID-related. It has a fairly short time window that you can spend it. But for whatever reason, it doesn't require the 20% match. So, um, Before I talk about watching this, so the bottom line is, um, if you think this is the worst idea ever, or um, if there are other projects you think we should try to get funding for, we should you should tell us, and we'll see if they match the criteria. But uh, over the years, we've gotten better at knowing what can get funded from them and what can't. Mm -hmm. But. Um, this Colfax project has been long in the making, and even if we have to build it in, in phases, um, it's really important to the city from a land use point of view and to urban renewal to Robin and my board in terms of what it can do for, in addition to safety, what it can do for land use out there. Uh, so the other one, which may or may not have been on your radar, but meets the funding criteria well of air, <coughs> air quality and multimodal is the idea of moving our signals from the 17th or 18th century into modern times. <laughs> or, um, you need these signals? <laughs> no, not hand signals. Traffic <laughs> signals. Okay. I'm That's all we had in the 18th century. Yeah. 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 Sometimes we, I'm sorry, go on. We had <laughs> um, And so I am in, in no way an expert, but we have communication problems among our signals. We have obsolescence problems with our equipment. We have bike detection problems. And they're not overly smart in terms of managing traffic at times when we have lots of pedestrians conflicting with right turns in the downtown area. <coughs> and so Joe's been working on that for for years trying to figure it out and every maybe every time we're going to do something either the technology changes um, that's one reason that the what was the mind thing called this morning the, the, the rover oh, the, the rover <laughs> the, the mind's rover um, even if we wanted to we couldn't get past washington avenue it had to turn around at arapaho street because it needed to talk to signals that were um, not obsolete in terms of technology. <laughs> you need to talk to smarter signals. That's so interesting. So, and in the capital improvement program, Joe has some funding that would nowhere near handle this problem, but it would handle the local match, either at 10% or 20%. Um, and 
one caveat that we always know and you will not be surprised is when you use federal money, everything costs more. It costs more because of dealing with CDOT, the reporting requirements, um, a wage thing called Davis-Bacon wages, mm -hmm. and for other reasons, it can easily cost 40, 50% more in certain types of projects. It, it might not for this because it's mostly purchasing equipment. So Muller Engineering, who worked for Joe and Ann, um, estimated about eight or nine hundred thousand dollars to do um, ten signals, uh, four on four downtown, no four in Washington, tenth, eleventh, twelfth, thirteenth, three on four, and then nineteenth and four, nineteenth and Jackson, and nineteenth in Illinois. So the ten downtown signals. Um, if you were replacing signals, it would be way more but it's replacing technology and upgrading technology. So if we round that up to probably 1.2 million because of the federal issues, that would mean that for either 120 or $240,000 local match, um, and it could be very quick, the Colfax project, because of the Lena Gulch issues, probably wouldn't get um, built until 24 at the earliest. So that's when we need our local match from the city and Gura. But this one, he already has the local match budgeted, and they want to spend this money quickly. Um, and right before the meeting, we were wondering how Buy American features into this, and so our consultant will have to figure that out. Are there um, hardware and, I guess it's not software, but are there hardware and cameras and things like that that, um, that will meet those requirements? So these are the two projects that we want to submit to um, um, go to city council and say, these are our best recommendations, is it okay? One of them is already budgeted, and the other one, we would have to find our local match in the 24 or 25 capital improvement program. And local match for 5 million, for example, at 20% would be 600,000 um, each, because um, the total would be 6.2 to get 5 million federal at 80% of 6.2 is 5 million. So, um, do you think that this is an okay idea for, um, without knowing more about dealing with Dr. Cog and this kind of money, <laughs> do you think that these are okay things that would benefit the community if we could get them and leverage our money five or 10 times? Mm -hmm. Could I do this? The smart lights. I don't know if that term is right. Upgrading to those lights. What's our benefit in having those? Um, depending on which, what sort of controller and system we go with, um, generally it's just a, a, an improved efficiency. Um, one, what the controllers that we have now are archaic. They're not 17th century, but um, they're archaic. They're called 170E. It's, it was kind of the bread and butter of the traffic signal world for ages and ages, but um, everything's moved on since then, except for the city of Colvin, and I'm sure there's other municipalities as well. The problem with them is, um, as they age, they be it becomes very problematic to program them for anything other than one timing scheme. One timing scheme does not work very well for the downtown corridor at all. Um, the, the winter demands are very different than the summer demands. The um, number of pedestrians alone um, you know, skyrockets during the summer months. Um, and also, we can't adjust it for different periods of the day. We can't, um, you know, give more through time in Washington during the morning and evening peaks um, for rush hour. Um, we just sort of run the, the same system all the time. We do have detection down there, which is, is helpful. Um, so we, we just kind of give the lion's share to the through movement and wait for detection to trigger the side street movement. Um, it's worked reasonably well to date, but it can certainly be better. But to answer the question, new, newer technology will improve the efficiency and allow us to better manage the traffic demands at different times of day and different times of the year. Um, improved um, detection will, um, well, we'll pick up bikes. Um, we'll, be, we'll have a, a set of cameras that can um, identify that there is a bicyclist in, in the, you know, sort of the box where it's detecting. Um, as opposed to only being able to detect a vehicle. Um, still struggling with the pedestrian detection. The technology seems to not quite be there, um, but um, if we 
upgrade the controllers and get better timing schemes, we can probably do away, well, we can definitely do away with the push button pedestrian detection, mm -hmm. just let it run um, with, with you know, automa automatic signals, pedestrian signals. Right now we don't do that, we have the buttons because, um, especially for the, the crossing of Washington, we have to time that through movement, the side street through movement to 2.5 feet per second for the sort of slow walkers, um, which is more time than the vehicle queue generally needs um, for the side street movements. But um, the, the approach will be to get rid of those pet buttons. That was a lot of words, I know about it too. You did, but then I, I wanna go further with it if you don't mind. Sure. Um, looking forward into the future, mm -hmm. if we do have this in place, would we potentially be able to run um, a vehicle like the ones that mines tried to run, and is that in our forward view? Yeah, absolutely. So we would include in whatever technology we, we select for this effort, we would make sure that it has the capability of detecting those vehicles, communicating with those vehicles, and changing its, its patterns for to accommodate those vehicles, absolutely. We don't anticipate the, the mines effort wasn't as successful as we might have hoped, but we haven't given up on that approach. Was it right. true? I'm sorry. No, oh. I would just, Go ahead. We'll both try. I would suspect that by making this type of an upgrade, so obviously th there will be all sorts of upgrades and improvements that will happen in coming years, but our base, our base equipment will be so much better that we'll right. be able to upgrade for for much more affordable prices for the next thing if it proves valuable. There's, there's always going to be the next thing, but it may not be a great idea for us. I was just going to say, was it true, at least grapevine talk, is that the mines vehicles, I live on 19th Street, by the way, um, but they, they couldn't get up the hill to get into the mines park. Is that, was that really true? Um, I have also heard that Golden's topography proved to be a bit of a challenge for those vehicles. I did not, I, it was mines running the program, so I wasn't terribly yeah. involved in the, in the maintenance of the units, but um, I have heard that they um, were routinely in the shop for just that reason. Mm -hmm. So we've got a big project and a small project. Are they in competition with themselves? <coughs> In any way, it's hard to tell. Oh, different we would, pots of money. Or? But the, we would have to. We would likely have to tell other cities in Jeffco which one um, of ours ranks. The the fear would be. Um, so sort of, but not really, because we, we can always change. We can always change or say we want to. We take partial funding for both. Um, the, the really encouraging thing is a number of cities in Jefferson County have said they don't have any applications for this, mm. this junior call. Um, but between Arvada and Weaver Ridge and Lakewood and us, we can <coughs> spend the 25 million pretty easily. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you have enough manpower to get both of these well, applications? I just, I just get the money. Oh, the applications, <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's not that hard to um, to make the applications, it's, and it's a little bit of a art and a science, mm -hmm. but we, uh, we do have concerns about bandwidth on, on staff, but the Colfax one is already 30% designed, we just need more funds, and I don't know, I'm hoping the other one is you have to consult and go out and buy all the equipment and install it. We would lean on Mueller most assuredly for the RFP to get this out, and then depending on how that came back, um, yes, it, it's not me installing the new equipment. It's generally much more work to build stuff than to buy equipment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if the streetlight project or the technology got funded, that'd be like a next summer thing? It seems like there'd be. The money would be fast. Um, it would be pretty quick to implement other than getting the equipment. I think the only delay would be that initial rate. So the supply chain right. issues may absolutely impact it. Um, the evaluation of um, different technologies would, would be very quick. So I, I, I assume that it would be quick implementation aside from 
so much <laughs> world events. Mm -hmm. Yes. And a question about the, the Colfax project that said in a number of the public meetings where the desire for the full you know, barricaded and separation and Those are 30 all, all that yeah. took place. We're kind of committed to that, what I'll call kind of an enhanced project, because I know there were kind of less intense solutions that were originally on the table. Descoping from a community standpoint isn't really never popular. No, no it's yeah. never popular, that's for yeah. sure. But what's also not so, popular is the current design of that road. Mm -hmm. Agreed. <laughs> like, so if we if we were not successful in getting more money, then that becomes a a serious value engineering, engineering question. Mm -hmm. um, are we willing to put it in, realizing that it probably needs to be phased to east of Heritage Road and south of Heritage Road, mm -hmm. um, just because of the planning for the adults? Uh, are we willing to do it all, or do we, or do you really save that much money? Say you change the separate the bike lane to a stripe. Um, mm -hmm. You save a few feet on each side of the road, which might make a difference. But haven't had that conversation. Yeah. You would probably be leaned on a lot more for that conversation than this one. Mm -hmm. You would counsel, like, what do we do? Yeah. Do we go half a project to the specs we like and keep looking for the money? Mm -hmm. Or do we scale back? Specifically, my job is just to get the money. Right. <laughs> All the young people on staff need to design and build the projects. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like with the timing of the call in city council meeting on June 14th, they need to, we need to have something, a recommendation to them. They can take action, allow yeah. our applications that, to get in. That would be great. Yeah. Now, we could go back for Colfax money in the fall, especially if we weren't trying to. If we don't try to get six in Heritage, then that call three in the fall would be a good target if, if we're not successful now. Mm -hmm. We keep trying um, to do that project if it's the, the main federally funded type project. Right. But I don't, I don't know how that will go. Um, the, the departments will start um, submitting projects for the capital improvement program um, in June-ish. So you mentioned these two projects meet this criteria that has to be met for this call. Are there others on your list that also meet the criteria that just didn't get prioritized? Or are these the only two? The ones that I know of are, um, well, for example, one time I was here and we were talking about um, Golden Road being a complete street. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's too early. Um, we don't know enough of what we're talking about for that. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the local things just don't compete. Mm -hmm. um, um, eight, well, eight, the infamous 8th Street. <laughs> yeah. like, uh -huh. A, we don't know what our design is, mm -hmm. but B, that, that kind of project would not compete. Um, because it's just such a small street compared with something like Colfax? Right, the type right. of traffic. The type of traffic, and yeah. Washington, um, now that we're recording, I can't tell our secrets. <laughs> Washington, really competed well because it touched downtown, which is, which is an urban center in Dr. Mm -hmm. Cabot, Cod Lingo, but also because of, at the time, we had um, three different bus routes at Temple Washington when the, the, the road bus mm -hmm. to Boulder, the GS, I think it's called, mm -hmm. was here. Mm -hmm. And so with the 16, the GS, and the flex ride, that, we got lots of extra points for touching downtown and touching that. That's the main reason we didn't apply for um, Colfax in 2016 or whenever that was, was because it didn't score nearly as well um, because of those downtown factors. Mm -hmm. um, in 2016, we were competing region-wide. So yeah. that's kind of the difference of the sub-regional pool is, um, especially if our neighbors don't have a bunch of projects, mm -hmm. like, like might happen in June. Mm -hmm. So I don't that's know of any, but if you look at the transportation master plan, there's all sorts of things mm -hmm. on there that are either um, too small or too local or too big, like State Highway 93, that we don't have anywhere near the money to ask for that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. The, just, I don't want to use all your time. The only reason we can now try to seek 
money for six and heritage uh, construction is that it was recently added to what's called the 2050 plan, the 2050 fiscally constrained, which is kind of in quotes because it's all a guess as to how much money there will be. We could not apply for anything on um, State Highway 93 other than operational or safety type projects that CNOT might want to do or we could maybe do with them. We could not do the, the version of take the road over and build someday interchanges because it's not on the fiscally constrained plan. Um, so one thing we do have on the 2050 fiscally constrained plan, um, and by way of confession, I just applied for it just for fun, was to have autonomous circulators through town. Um, figuring that by then, the technology <laughs> would probably be better. It was open um, anyway. <laughs> um, but that type, of a, that type of a project doesn't, transit type projects like that don't require to be on the plan. It's big roadway projects have to be well in advance. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Colfax project, the Washington Avenue project are considered more operational. Mm -hmm. So you can apply for them when you're ready. I see. But we do not have any better ideas. I think there's a lot of things we want to accomplish in town, but are, it's either too early or they're too local. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So could that be a thumbs up? Sounds so, so to me. I, that, I yeah. Think from your group, you're looking for just a general yeah. approval, or you're crazy yes. to go away, Steve. Yeah, no. I think both. If there's a possibility. Go away. Well, in, oh. in, in that discussion, Steve, is there is there money for a flex ride that we could apply for? Yes, please. Let's do that. Oh no. No? Oh, so something either good or not good that's going on is RTD is trying to get out of the local transportation business and um, Joe's counterpart Rick Murphy is kind of more involved with, with this RTD effort. I forget what the name of it is. Reimagine. Reimagine RTD. But, they were not willing to have anyone submit any projects for these, any of the 22 calls for new service for them. But they're talking about giving part of the tax money back to locals if we want to run our own. Okay. So I think it's I think it's just premature right this, this year to know okay. what that means. Um, I think council would support it um, quite a bit. Um, there is talk about um, whether we will start trying to run shuttle, if nothing else, to put Creek and downtown users over in those 400 parking spaces mm -hmm. over there. Yeah. yeah, well that is happening this summer, right? The, the shuttle for the Creek? I don't know. Oh, oh I thought that was one, one outfitter oh, that's, has agreed to do it. That's one. Oh, right, it was yeah. the private the shuttle, the not shuttle. the public. Right, the ordinance yes. requires them next year, any outfitter. I Let's see. It's changed. And Adventure West is, says they're going to. I saw their bus today. And their little shuttles. Mm -hmm. um, the city may still try. Um, cool. The other kind of the problem with this is you have to plan. Um, it can't be something you want to do now. It has to be something you want to do in either one to three or four years right. based on the money. Yeah. Well, I have a little bit of an update about the flex ride. Yeah. But I can update that during other business or in, in the study session. Ooh, I have a per permit parking update for you. Um, when people with not the same last name try to register lots of vehicles at a house, the, um, the lady in PD refers them to the people who are the too many students in a house police. Oh. And I don't know what happens with that because sometimes it's hard to prove. Yeah. But um, it, it is it is taken note of. That, Somebody's paying attention. Yeah, yeah that, exactly. Now, if you all have the same last name, and you have a family like me that has lots of cars. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. I would excuse yeah, you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Steve. Um, Steve. I'll you come back or send in Byerly back in the fall if we try for her. Call yeah. three and four money. <laughs> we'll see you then. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. It makes me think of that, uh, the thing we always talked about with the train station up. Our wish list. East yeah. part of town, yeah. yeah. 
if RTD is not going to hang out with us anymore, then extending the gold line. The gold yeah, line. the gold line. Yeah. Gold line. Gold. All right. Oh, Joey, <laughs> the door was closed, so you don't go out this way and make the alarm go off. I you do. Like the door open or closed? Um, either way, it's fine. <laughs> Dealer's choice, Steve. <laughs> um, all right, that was all for the regular meeting. So now we need um, a motion, second, and a vote to go to the study session and the chat. Motion to go to the study session. Yeah. Thank you. Second. Aye. <laughs> We've never said aye before. Okay. No, it's just, I'm. It's just assumed. We're getting, we're getting more official. I don't mean to do that. I'm happy that we are the most mm -hmm. informal board out there. Um, you don't necessarily want us to follow rules. I, I, I want us to have a conversation. I just, <laughs> the rules become important if we can't have a meaningful conversation if people talk over each other or something like that. It's never been a problem for us. So, okay, we're in, we're in study session and I wanted to devote some time to welcome new members and basically all of us go around and kind of introduce ourselves and um, I don't know, maybe a bit about background and um, certainly a bit about why you wanted to be a member of the board. Who wants to lead? I mean, this applies to the existing members as well because let's, let's they, do the new let's do the new folks first, and then we'll some some light hazing. All right, <laughs> <laughs> you got to get along to be on the board. <laughs> um, who wants to lead? I can start. Um, I'm Christian von Weingarten. Um, my background is in geology and GIS, and I did consulting for like four and a half years officially. I guess I still do that, but more freelance, just random stuff while I'm working on other projects also. Um, but yeah, I've always had an interest in like government and political science and that kind of stuff. It's always kind of fascinated me. So I saw this come up in the Golden Informer and was like, hey, this is a chance to actually step into this and actually get involved in something, so that's why I'm here. Which neighborhood do you live in? Um, what is that, Southridge? I'm on South Golden and Ulysses, those towns oh, yeah. right across mm -hmm. from the skate park. Oh, yeah, yeah I know the ones. Yeah. Well, wait, I didn't realize those were occupied yet. Did you just move in like five minutes ago? No, these are the ones that were built in like 05. Oh, okay. Maybe yeah. I don't know the ones then. Yeah, like a hundred feet from King Supers. Yeah, uh, pretty much. Oh, okay, I got you. I got you. Yeah, it is. It's very convenient. The Valero cool. station right there on the corner, right? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And a greenhouse right now too. Yeah. Which is nice. That's not a bad neighbor. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love yeah. that greenhouse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. a great one. But yeah. We'll great. See. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, how, wait, one more question. Sorry. Sure. Go ahead. How long have you lived in Golden? Uh, eight years. Coming up on eight years. Yeah. So. Nice. Me too. <laughs> so I'm Elaine Marola, and we moved to Golden eight years ago. Um, in retirement, we had lived in Denver back in the 70s and always said we wanted to come back. Would never have chosen Golden. No. Having lived here for a while back then. But um, yeah, somebody we knew who lived here forever said, yeah, you should go to Golden. And we rented a place and bought a house just before the break. <laughs> so immediately somebody I met said, you should do Leadership Golden because then you learn all about the city. Mm -hmm. So that's how I know Dixie. Mm -hmm. So I got involved with that. I, I was a student and I've been with them and on their board since then, pretty much seven years I guess. Are you still? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Um, it's well worth it because I feel like what we produce is an awareness for the community of how we operate, which is a little different from most of the places I've lived, and I lived in three different states. Um, so it's nice to get a product where we're putting people into this community who have the leadership awareness and skills and talent. Anyway, why I'm here specifically is because I brought my mom out um, three, four years ago from Rhode Island, originally Rhode Island. 
and dealing with her in um, one of the um, senior living spaces makes me well aware of how we don't address the needs of our seniors. And one of those is transportation. We definitely, she turns 100 in September, we definitely don't want these people driving. We don't, but we don't give them any options. And that ride is problematic mm -hmm. because it's not always on time and it often doesn't pick them up and leaves these seniors stranded somewhere, often in the dark. So that by itself, but then, this business about everybody coming to Golden, which we love, we love everybody coming to Golden, making it hard for those of us who live here, as was our issue earlier, to actually live here. So I would like to see a transportation system that's similar to one like a mountain, where we have outlying parking and people drive in, park in the outline, and hop on a bus with their tube, with their bike, with their picnic. Um, so that was one of the interests in the smart lights is can we, can we get a system like that eventually? So those are my interests. And that's fine. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to be here. You said you live on 19th. I live on you north so, of North of 6th, south? Yeah, so I'm, I'm part way up Lickup in the turn. Mm -hmm. Okay, I would say it's my address is Smith Road, uh -huh. but I'm on the corner overlooking what is a true disaster in our community. Better because of the changes. Um, and please don't ever make a bike lane that wide again. <laughs> People drive in that bike lane all uh, the time. Um, and that's where you fall. Don't do that, I call that. Um, yeah, so I, that's a whole other thing, isn't it? We've had a lot but of discussions. Had some conversations <laughs> about that. Many. <laughs> yeah, but it's lovely. I mean, it's a <laughs> Thank you. My name is Rick Rubin. I live on 9th Street. I've lived in Golden since 2005. I grew up in Dove Creek, Colorado, which is a town of 600 people. My nearest neighbor was over two miles away. So, Golden. But I was required to come live with relatives to go to high school here. Uh, it was a quite a culture shock. I went to Wheatridge High School, I used to come to Golden, where the Coors Short Tour is operated, mm -hmm. I was old enough to go. <laughs> As we take sack, I was done at 11.30, take sack lunch. Golden was quite different then. It was very much, uh, if you looked at somebody kind of cross-eyed, they'd take a poke at you, mm -hmm. kind of town. I never imagined living here. Uh, moved from Boulder. Can't wait to get into conversations about don't boulder my golden <laughs> because I think boulder does a lot of things right. Uh, I work in meteorology, specifically the next generation of weather models that come out of NOAA and NCARP. I work at NCARP. Uh, I'm interested in this because in the times since I've started living here, it's become increasingly more difficult to get around town by foot or by bike, which I prefer to do. And it's become increasingly more difficult to want to go places because you feel like you can't come back and have your life back because it's inundated living in the Creek Corridor. The Creek Corridor is really important to me since I live there, but everything that happens outside of the Creek Corridor directly impacts that. So it is a symbiotic relationship that is not positive in a lot of ways, and I'd like to see it become more positive. I want to be able to get into downtown without doing <laughs> 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 That's not possible. Good so. luck with that. I know. <laughs> well, one might argue you already are in downtown. <laughs> you live, I think, yeah. closer than any of us. One might, but then again, when Patty's here, you might argue that Patty's in downtown, but she's not. She's not? Yeah. Well, she's in the there's residential periphery. It's, it's true. To find downtown, I live yeah. in a residential neighborhood. Right? It's true, yeah. It's not downtown. Mm -hmm. no. <laughs> yeah, that's a personal opinion. Sorry. <laughs> Enough editorializing. Thank you. 
Um, I'm Dixie Turman. I have been on this board since its inception in 2018. And so I just was um, just applied and I was just started my second term. And before that, I was two terms on the Historic Preservation Board, which is similar in some ways, dealing with development and redevelopment and, and those kinds of questions, neighborhoods. Um, I've lived in Golden for close to 40 years now, I think. Lots of changes. You probably didn't know it back when it was a ghost town, but... Uh, so you were, you were here when it was the rough and tumble, and someone might take a jab at you? Well, see, I don't remember that part. Really? I mean, it was very much a blue-collar town for a long time. It, it would have a lot to do with teenagers, beer, <laughs> what the Buffalo Rose used to be. Mm -hmm. That second one. That, that, yeah. that second item there, that, that's just... I'm common denominator in so many of those sorts of situations. <laughs> well, you said you went to Wheat Ridge. I didn't go to Wheat Ridge High School. Did they know you were from Wheat Ridge when they tried to poke you? I'm sure most of them did. See, there's a big rivalry between Golden and Wheat Ridge. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. Shoot, the, down, down, the kids from Denver used to call us White Ridge. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, they're right. well <laughs> yeah, they're not wrong. Um, so, anyway, I, I started working at Mines in 70, 78. Did you move to Golden for your job at Mines, or did you get your job after you moved here? Um, when I first, oh, I lived in Fort Collins oh, you did. and moved to Denver mm -hmm. because I got a job at Mines. I see. And lived in Denver for a few years and then, then lived in address golden but unincorporated mm -hmm, right. so I've lived in several places but mm -hmm. golden's home mm -hmm. grew up in Estes Park mm -hmm. so not not a whole lot of people can say that <laughs> <laughs> yeah not anymore but anyway I like living in golden I like uh, contributing to the community and doing what I can to Make it a better place. I guess. I guess that's the leadership golden influence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I'm Eric Peterson, and uh, like Dixie, uh, well, that's where he's been on the board since it, since it first started. Mm -hmm. Trying to figure out what we wanted to be when we grew up. <laughs> it, took, it took a while to get our feet under Still us. Still, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've been in Golden for 17 years now. I've uh, lived in a number of different parts of the city. I used to live down by the community center on 9th Street. Lived in Stonebridge, lived by the high school. I can actually say I was a downtown resident. I lived for a while at 14th and Washington in wow. one of the uh, big old mansions that con got converted to condo buildings uh, just up the hill from Woody's and the Vision Clinic. <laughs> um, so yeah, been lots of different places, uh, walking, biking, all around. I currently live up uh, on Butte Parkway, which is up Boyd Street and up by Peary Parkway, up in that uh, kind of, I guess the north side of North Table Mountain. <laughs> so whenever I bike now, I got to make it up the hill at the end. So I got to make sure I got enough juice it's a big deal. <laughs> to make it up the hill at the end because there's very few rides I can do that don't involve going up the hill. <laughs> That's why I had to buy an electric bike. Oh, yeah. so I live on the hill too. <laughs> um, uh, I, I'm in the construction industry uh, really my whole career from design side and construction side. Uh, I currently work for a company that does kind of specialty inspections for facilities that aren't there aren't a lot of around here. Semiconductor facilities, pharmaceutical plants, things like that, doing all the certifications of, of those facilities. Uh, but uh, originally, uh, like like you, a product of uh, leadership, Golden, and uh, you know, I was looking for opportunities to get involved. So when MTAM was formed. Uh, it just hit a lot of my uh, personal interests. Thought I had a little bit of background to contribute because I deal with a lot of, you know, urban planning and, and development issues uh, 
uh, in my career, but really, you know, that's when Golden was really, well, I guess it's been blowing up for a long time, and depending on how long you've been here. But, you know, just kind of the planning issues around transportation, bikes, hiking access is, is something I'm very personally uh, interested in. And I feel like in front of us with the heart of Golden and Ninth Street redevelopment, there's really, you know, a, once in a lifetime, but there's certainly once in a in a decade opportunity of change that's in front of us, and we have an opportunity to really do it right, uh, or look back 15 years from now and go, why didn't we think of that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> there was an obvious miss. So really, kind of looking to being able to knit all these different initiatives and uh, opportunities in front of us together to do it right. I'm Therese. Um, I've lived in Golden since 2015, so seven years. Uh, I live, I live not that far from Eric, like, well, my living situation's a little confusing, but the house that I own and will eventually live in is on First Street. I don't live in my house right now. No, oh, it's such a complicated mess. I'm living in temporary. I currently live in the like townhomes next to Mitchell Elementary School. Oh, okay. Our, Canyon Point? Yeah, Canyon mm -hmm. Point that are like, um, they all look identical yeah. and they haven't been updated since the 90s. Sweet. That's where I'm temporarily living. My real house is on First Street, um, first and between Ford and East. Um, um, so I am an engineer. I'm a mechanical engineer by training, professional engineer in Colorado. Um, I recently had a career shift though. I switched jobs. Yeah, I know, big life change. I used to do consulting for utilities and now I do consulting for um, large corporations who need to make sustainability goals. Oh wow, cool. I've always been in like sustainability consulting, but I shifted from utilities to corporates. Um, and I got a new job. Is it retrofitting the existing buildings and things of that nature? Or? It's more like, you know how a company needs to like, so everyone's like, you gotta be net zero by X date, or yeah. you've gotta like mm -hmm. reduce your emissions by X date. Like, so all the companies wanna do that, and corporates need to lead the way, but they can't do that without like actually making Really? So it's like helping yeah. them make Jackson that plan, plan. Okay, yeah, cool. and like awesome. helping them to like make a target that actually matches with their like operations and their footprint and everything. Yeah. So we help companies quantify their greenhouse gas fr footprint and then make a plan for reducing it, hopefully with a net zero goal in mind. Um, so that's my career. Um, I have two kiddos that are my other career because they take up all my time. They're, one of them just turned four, and the other one is just about seven. And um, there's something else. Like, oh, why I wanted to be on this board. It was similar to Eric. I had just finished Leadership Golden in 2017, and then the MTAB applications were like in October, I think, of 2017. So it wasn't that much longer after I had finished Leadership Golden, but... Um, I thought, it was, like, I thought it was cool because I don't have any like one specific issue. I always think we should always, always, always build things to be more sustainable and like not just in the energy efficiency type of way, but also in the like long-term planning type of way. But beyond that, it was more of like it touches every single person's life. Like every single person has like mobility and transportation in their life in some way. It's like very, very multifaceted and that was fascinating to me. I think that's what I wrote on my application all those years ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyway, yeah, I think that's it. Very good, thank you all. Um, Dixie, you wanna go first with your new business or? Sure. Um, we got a letter from, um, I think it was the Vice President of the Associated Students at Mines a few months ago. Wait, who's we? Just you personally? It or? came to the city, oh, and okay. it came to you. 
and we talked about it at one of our meetings, oh. and I said, I'll contact this guy. Oh, yes, I remember. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I, in, in what he was saying was that the, okay, now the terminology here is ludicrous, the way RTD does this. There was something called a flex route that was a f that was a fixed route around Golden. Mm -hmm. it, it had it had stops that were set, mm -hmm. and it made a circuit. And then there was the flex ride. Call and ride. Right. But, but if you look at their website, they both have the word flex in them. Okay. But they're two different things. But they're two different mm -hmm. things. Yes. And the flex ride was where you would call and make a reservation, or call and say, can you pick me up at 10.30 and take me to the light rail station? And it, it goes wherever people ask to be picked up. So it was a taxi, sort of. It's like an Uber, more than a taxi. Kind of, yeah. Kind of. Um, but it had, it had a zone that they couldn't go outside of. So the, the circuit was discontinued during COVID. And I have had to admit that I didn't know that. Um, but it turns out there are a lot of employees at mines, mostly food service and custodial type people who relied on that for transportation to get to work. And the call and make a reservation to get you know, to get it to come to you was less than useful for a lot of people. Though people that are lower income don't live in Golden, in that area, for the most part. So I think what was happening is people were coming into Golden on the light rail and needing to be picked up and taken to campus. Not that that was the only place where people needed. So anyway, I wrote, the, I wrote this guy and I said, okay, let me, let me make sure I understand what you are talking about. And I said, looking at the website, there's this and there's this, and I think you're talking about the little circulator. And yes, that was, that was true. So uh, our RTD representative is Marjorie Sloan, who used to be the mayor of Golden, and I know her, I know her quite well. So I wrote to Marjorie and said, I've had, we've had this inquiry. Um, can you give me some idea if, if RTD plans to reinstate this service? And she wrote me back, said, I don't know the answer to that. I'm copying you know, the person at RTD who will get back in touch with you. Well, the person got back in touch with me, it took a while. But basically, we don't have the money. We don't have the ability to do it. We'll revisit it in the fall. And I spoke to Marjorie subsequently, and I said, I'm not very happy with their response. I don't like what they had to say. Uh, and she, you know, things, things have to work out into the future with RTD. They have to have public meetings about service changes and. Things don't happen quickly. But in the meantime, I had a conversation with Casey Brown, one of the members of city council. And he told me that Golden was considering putting the circulator back in place at city expense. Now, he didn't, he didn't tell me about RTD not wanting to get out of that business. So when it first started, the city contributed to the operation. And I don't know what the, what the split was, what kind of a ratio it was. But then it turns out it was the most used circulator in any of the RTD areas. Clearly they needed to cut that. Yeah, well, really. RTD it's took it over. They oh, took it yeah. over because they wanted the income. That was yeah. frustrating. I so instead that. of a partnership where the city might have had some chance of continuing it, right. although no one, I won't say no one, so few people were going to work during the pandemic. Yeah, I can see why it was hard to run. I mean, people mm -hmm. were not, you know, were not using public transportation. So 
if RTD is truly getting out of the business and, and there is some chance of the city doing it themselves, maybe in conjunction with a tubing stop, or maybe not, but I, 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 I wish, the, if city council is contemplating that, I wish they would tell us. Um, I do too. I can certainly inquire um, through CMO and see if, where it is. Um, if it is going to be scheduled at some point, then yes, I agree. We should have a voice in that. Mm -hmm. um, that is most assuredly our, our wheelhouse. Okay. I'd, so. I'd like to piggyback on that. <clears throat> I started the conversation with Dr. Sloan as soon as she got the board for RTD. And I went to at least one of the coffee with counselors where this topic came up, and Casey Brown was one who was present. And he said the same thing to me that you repeated, that there's no sense in waiting for RTD, that Golden has to do it. It's and it sounded to me like Steve was saying that that money might be appropriated through RTD. Well, just the, 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 the tax and back yeah, to that's the That's what I yeah, thought he said. Yeah. Yes. So I also it sounds like a win-win. And maybe that why why isn't this group informed of that is the curiosity. Well, I was a bit Incredibly embarrassed. I was a bit embarrassed that I didn't know more. Mm -hmm. um, but I admitted it. And did you ever get back to that fellow who wrote? I did. Oh, okay. I did. I wrote back to him and told him what I, you know, what I had learned, and I need to write him again mm -hmm. and say, you know, well, now that you're, he's probably gone for the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'd like to be able to say the city's working on it, or the city has a plan, or... Let me do some digging. Okay. I mean, part of this is, is that the engineering division is, is, has never has not historically been terribly involved in, uh, involved at all in the transit side of things. Um, so a bit of a issue with you know your staff liaison, the board's staff liaison, um, being in the engineering division and not having been terribly involved historically. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that I can't become more involved and certainly can't, doesn't, I mean, I can run down information and answer questions. Mm -hmm. But that sure. is within this group. Oh, absolutely, 100%. But part of the problem is that since this this board didn't exist before 2018, there's really very little in the city code that says you have to go to this board. Right. Mm -hmm. And people kind of forget a little bit about us, it seems. Like, I mean, not a whole lot, but it's not part of their protocol. I agree. To come hang out with us. Well, did you happen to see the story in the Denver Post today that Golden is considering lowering the speed limits in all the residential areas. What well, a segue to our first item. Oh my gosh, I did <laughs> second, not see this. Story. Second item. Um, so, well, here, let me, let me run through. Another thing, you'd have think, you'd think we'd have known about that. Well, no, I, I can explain how that came about. It wasn't staff. So, um, um, let me run through 10th Street and Creek issues before I get to that. So, there are going to be some changes um, along the Creek corridor. Um, 12th Street went through our sort of process, 10th Street, 9th Street neighborhoods, there will be some modifications to the existing, well, I, 10th Street does not have a permanent parking system, it's going to have one, it's going to sort of mimic the downtown system. Um, 9th Street, both such, both zones of the 9th Street permit parking area as well as 12th Street are sort of being packaged into a resolution that's going to go to council soon. Um, I've already written the memo and forgive me, I, I wrote it in such a way that um, well, it reflected the choice that you made tonight. Um, okay. I wrote it in advance because I'm not here tomorrow. So, um, if we had made the opposite choice, you'd be having a bad day off I, tomorrow. So I don't know if you noticed, but I picked up my phone and I texted my director, and I, I told her I would give her the go ahead or let her know if it didn't go the way that I anticipated, um, as soon as I knew, so that she could get going on revising the memo and resolution. <laughs> Perfect. Um, but that it worked out. Efficient very, work, very Joe. Thing worked out. Um, so, anyways, it, the the 10th Street permit area is not going to follow our system. It's going to be a test to a, a very sort of quickly implemented test to make sure, well, to try and get ahead of the crowds that we expect this summer. At the end of this test, um, if we want to make 
if the city desire, you know, if it works and everything is hunky dory, um, the city will look to make that more permanent, and we will follow our system, including public outreach and coming to this board for a formal recommendation, as well as coming to council for a more, well, a, a permanent uh, placement of that. It, it's my understanding of how that's going to happen. That's all I know on 10th Street. But changes to that, to both 12th and 9th, are associated with that, and largely due to the, well, the massive crowds we see and um, along the creek trying to mitigate. So can you just back up a bit? What is the change to the 10th Street parking? It does not exist. It's going to make a permit parking system. So area residents will have a permit. Um, everything else will be will mimic the downtown, which is two hours free than pay. Oh, okay. So some so kiosks along the city hall. It impacts like the library. library. Parks, yeah. yes, everything along the streets. Um, I don't see any. Um, the, the, one, the sort of overflow, the community center is going to be off limits and sort of guarded. If you're not heading to the community center or to Lions Park, you should not be parking there. There will be sort of stopped and questioned. Whoa, um, that takes a staff member. It does indeed. Wow, that's a big investment. Um, the visitor center. Question mark. They're, they're griping like hell because, mm -hmm. because the city wants to implement it, not all day parking in that lot. Um, so, a bit of an ongoing question mark. I can't anonymize it for you, given that. Um, everything else, uh, you know, the, the public works building, they're, they're planning the public works building um, that we occasionally meet in is sort of during the week, employees only, some for, you know, visitors to that building coming to get a permit or do some business. Um, the overflow lot for the community center is kind of open, um, so I, I expect that will be parked in extensively. Um, I think that's a, oh, well, the, the library parking lot between the library and Illinois Street is the same, sort of two hour area in the um, I think that's all of the areas. The shift for 12th Street and 9th Street is to make it daily, I, th I think, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, right now, it's, it's Monday to Friday and set times. We're going to keep the times for those areas, but move it to the weekends as well. Basically, hit the, the day time. Ninth Street is currently only one, one to six p.m. only Saturday and Sunday. It will be coming to seven days a week. Okay, and then expanded hours expanded as well. Hours. Yeah, okay, but not twenty-four-seven. Not overnight. Not, no, not twenty-four-seven. Oh, okay, gotcha. The 12th Street request was very much seven days a week, 24 hours a day, so uh, that's how that was packaged and will be sent. Um, citywide speed limits. Yes, the 20th is plenty. Um, so it was not staff initiated, uh, it was council initiated. Um, Councilor Cameron and Casey sort of um, pitched the idea, um, initially approached staff um, just very recently. Um, uh, PD, Public Works, CMO. Um, Staff had zero opposition. We're, we're, we're very much in favor of that sort of change. Um, I, I, I certainly don't have any qualms with slowing people down, um, while well, at least stating that the speed that they ought to be traveling is 20 miles an hour as opposed to 25, as in the model traffic code for residential areas. Um, so wait, that, this would be a change to the, just the residential areas or all the no, I, I don't think anybody's anticipating that we would change like arterials and collectors to, oh, okay. to be 20 miles an hour. Smaller residential, residential streets. streets. Smaller, okay, yeah. Okay. And so we talked a few years ago about how it was always the wrong speed limit anyway, right? Like, it wasn't according to whatever thing, traffic thing? Are you, are, you, are you referencing the very morbid graph of what happens to you if you get hit at certain speeds? Maybe that was it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, FHWA has a really gross not gross, just a morbid graph, you know, showing mortality rates with, you know, for vehicle and pedestrian impacts at different speeds. And so knocking, if we can knock down, you know, that five miles an hour, it tends to um, well, really help the impact of the pedestrian. That's a gross way of putting it, sorry. Um, <laughs> you might survive if you hit it 20. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the conversation you're referring to is about the neighborhoods that were 20. <coughs> But then we had neighborhoods that had been given a for whatever reason, and kind of the squeaky wheel got turned oh, yes. right. Well, and it this wasn't consistent throughout the city, right, and right. some roads got 
special treatment and all this? You got it. Um, but this is going to make it um, citywide for residential type streets and probably some other streets. Um, there'll be an exercise at some point to kind of figure out what does it make sense to um, apply this to some of the different roads. Washington is one that comes to mind. It's supposed to be 25 now. Does it kill anything if we lower that to 20, given that it is you know, a lot of pedestrians? You can't go um, more than 20 on it anyway. On Washington? Well, in downtown. I you know, I'm, I'm, thinking, <laughs> oh. I'm thinking like North Washington. Oh, so uh, okay. North. Mm -hmm. um, um, or even between 58 and in downtown, 10th. In 10th, yeah, for mm -hmm. sure. People go pretty dang fast oh, in that stretch. Yeah, can. What I thought was interesting in the article, though, was that every place that had done it, Boulder, uh, some place in Oregon, so a couple, every single one of them, once the signage was changed, the, the, the speed has been lowered, the speed increased. Yeah, that's interesting. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So if it doesn't work, what is the answer? But you can't enforce it, and that's where where I live. People going up and down lookout. There's there's no way to enforce it. The police really want to, but you have to have a stretch that's straight enough for radar to work and that kind of thing. That's never enough. The answer is traffic calming or narrowing streets. And the number on the sign. Yes, data will tell you that the number on the sign does not typically change driver behavior drastically. There is some data from FHWA that says that it will shave a couple of miles an hour, especially in that 10 mile an hour bracket over the posted speed limit, so 25 to 35 presently. It might shave a couple of miles an hour of those sorts of drivers. The people above that, they know they're speeding. They don't care. Um, they. Uh, the number on the sign is not going to impact their behavior whatsoever. Mm -hmm. They're going to drive at their comfortable speed. You got it. Mm -hmm. the, the true way to lower speeds is vertical or horizontal deflection. I mean, this is what we've talked about for the manual for, um, mm -hmm. for a very long time now. Four years. In any event, this is a bit, it's going to come to this board. I will do a bunch of research and you know find these experiences and see what data is available. I absolutely, if, if this is going to move forward and we're going to roll this out, um, I don't see any reason not to do that. Uh, I don't have great confidence that it's going to move the needle a ton, but if it moves it a bit, I'm all for it. Um, if it does roll out, I'm going to do a lot of data collection within the city and take speeds before, um, give it some time to adjust, and take speeds after, see if we did, in fact, move the needle or if um, driver behavior stayed the same and just kind of, they kind of drive at their comfort level. Um, would it be a big investment for the city? Like, yeah. I know it would, you'd need to change out the signs, but, and then no, you'd have to like argue at council, but what else? No, I, I don't expect that there would be a lot of opposition to this sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't anticipate that, but who knows? I, mm -hmm. I, I am terrible at being the pulse of a Well, I can tell you one outcome will be lower, lower the speed limit, and there's not enforcement to back it up. You'll get that, that, will you'll get that outcry. Of yeah. mm -hmm. Enforcement, enforcement. I, what's the what's PD doing? Yeah, and, and I think PD is well aware of that mm -hmm. potential. So I, I would expect that they would step, you know, step up enforcement. You know, I, I didn't see the article. PD's call. They're all in. in. They're in. just. They're in. Well, I'm not opposed to lowering the speed limit if it works, but 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 why pass? Why have a law that you can't enforce, or that you you know is going to be. Followed. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's, it's absolutely an enforceable law. Um, whether or not it gets followed, I, it, you know, I don't know. These sorts of things, changing draft driver behavior without that horizontal and vertical reflection, I think, takes a long time, right? Um, so there's going to be, as far as the investment, the changing of the signs is easy, right? We don't post, we typically have not posted residential speed limit signs in most oh, neighborhoods. Yeah. Um, we, I, I did a search in our asset management system. We have 59 out of the system that are posted at 25. I assume most of those are in residential areas. Some of them may not be. Washington, for example, we, we, we could argue it is a residential area, but it also serves as you know, sort of a collector, or mm -hmm. the golden material, I suppose. Um, anyway, it's 59 signs. It's not a huge investment. Um, we would, I would probably also push to go and just we should put more signs out in residential neighborhoods to really reinforce that we've done, we've made this change and let people know. Um, 
um, so double that. We're, we're at 100 ish times. It's not a huge investment. We do it all in house, we make them in house. Um, so it's not, that's not a big financial issue. Um, I think probably a more, a bigger financial issue would just be the, the, the public education campaign and the public outreach campaign associated with this. When Denver did it, they, they did a lot of yard signs. Not that they're terribly expensive, but you know, 20 is 20 sort of campaign and yard signs and just really get the word out. So I don't, I don't see it as a big financial issue for the city or investment for the city. Um, unless there's things that I'm, I'm just not. What's the speed limit on Ford? I know we've talked about this 100 times. Okay. Standards on 10. Mm -hmm. Which is never followed. Almost never. Well, so that's the thing is that when you talk about like, oh, well, they're not going to enforce it. They'll enforce it probably exactly as much as they enforce the current speed limit. Right? I mean. Well, I don't know if I step up there, So when you recall, we had the, the item from PD um, on the radar speed enforcement. Mm -hmm. I think that that is going to move forward as well. I'm not certain of that, um, but I would expect that that would move forward as well and certainly would lend a hand to enforcement. Mm -hmm. this, change. Yeah. Uh, well, this is just this is just me, and it's, it's, so it's anecdotal, but I think there is way more speed checking on Golden Streets now. Since the change in command? That's what I'm guessing. Thought that, but who, you know, we don't have data. And do you I, mean I, with the like non-human kind of checking or like Willie's with, officer? With an officer. Oh, okay. Sitting with a speed gun. Mm -hmm. There was a motorcyclist, motorcycle police sitting at, oh, roughly 6th and Heritage mm -hmm. a couple days ago, just, just east of 6th and Heritage. Um, checking speed on Heritage or Spring? Checking speed on six. On six, okay. It was golden. Mm. I, I've just, I've seen way more checking Good. around. And I thought, maybe it's our change in chief of yeah, police. Yeah, chief. It has a different emphasis. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Interesting. I don't <coughs> know either. Um, which segues nicely into our last item, which is the traffic calming manual. Um, obviously, we've structured our, our criteria and um, our manual around the default speed being 20, so I've got some work to do to catch that up, should this move forward, so this is a nice way to pause and say, if this goes forward, I've got to tweak, it's not a lot of work, I don't think, but tweak, tweak our criteria to, to reference 20 as opposed to 25. Mm -hmm. Not a huge issue, but adoption of the manual, we can still work on it. Adoption of the manual should wait until this is sort of out. Mm -hmm. So why don't you send that to us again? The manual? Yeah, let our new members. Yeah, no, that's it's a, a draft. Good. It's a, a draft. very, very rough draft. There has been zero polishing to date, and it's all just my words and the board's opinions on some okay. certain things. But yes, I can send that out. Joe has no help. Joe does all the work by himself. I, I'm not all the work. There's other city employees. Well, you're doing well, <laughs> Take some credit, Joe. You don't have staff all support for that. All yeah. the credit for our meetings is done by Joe. So I, we that, that's, that's how I would I We are the only board who does not have an administrative support person. Yep. Mm -hmm. We've had one in and out, in and out. In and out that's yeah, correct. Yeah, that's correct, but it's not a, it's not a priority. I'm OK. Everything's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I had a conversation with our former mayor about that. <laughs> um, yeah. I, um, I, things are working, things are changing, but they're not going to be fast. So I, there's light at the end of the tunnel. It's not a train. It just might take some time for us to get there. So no worries. Well, you need a Stacy. Who can? Stacy would be so great. God, she she was so great for HPV. I'm Marissa. She worked for Steve. Mm -hmm. You know, she prepared these. You know, she would do, she'd Facts, go back yeah, and do research. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, and I say she, it doesn't have to be a she, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I wish it was more of a priority. You're a pretty expensive <laughs> clerical help. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't disagree. Um, we have a conversation around that today, actually. <laughs> Good times. Um, I don't have anything else. Thank you. Matters for referral to other boards. Uh, for another board? But you think the, the, the 
electronic enforcement issues going to circle back? I don't know that it would come to us. It kind of came to us, and everybody looked more. Everybody said, hey, Good. let's go. I think it's, it, and I think it already got to council, it will shortly. I believe it already has gone to council, and I would have to go back and check and see what they said. I assume that the answer was, yes, of course, we will just go. Um, the next step would be budgeting, and, and you know, um, we all get into a cage and fight each other, the different departments, <laughs> between the champion, Golden and the government gets lion's share of money. Golden has a lot of money. I, they're, I, they're very healthy. I don't disagree, but there's also a lot of competing efforts and ideas and projects. So I, I would expect that this will play well in the budgeting process and um, that we will have some radar speed enforcement um, in the near future. I have no idea how long it takes to roll something like that out. <coughs> Maybe um, that's eligible for some of the uh, lodging tax because that's to mitigate effects of visitors. Perhaps. Oh. There you go. I forgot about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had a question. I wanted. I was curious if there's an update because we skipped our April meeting. Last time we met was March 31st, and we had met two weeks before that on snowy winter day to talk about the creek and all the things that are going to happen in the creek this summer and what we recommended to council. Did yeah. you get an update from council on whether our recommendations would be adopted? Um, not directly from council. Well, yes, I guess I did. So not all of them. Um, I was a bit disappointed that the, the one recommendation that I thought was the most meaningful and probably the most impactful would have been bike parking. Um, for all of the residents that come that ride their bike to the creek but don't really need a bike on the creek, it's just clutter on, on the creek corridor. If they could stow those, it would make a lot of sense. I haven't heard that that's going to happen. Um, I may see if I can cart up some areas and just do it. Um, or they may have recommended it. What I have heard absolutely that will be implemented is um, wayfinding stripes down both sides of the oh, really? which I think will help. Um, the, our communications division is working on the idea, but not really our, the idea of the plazas not being blocked, so just some messaging at the, the bridge plazas and the other you know, trail junction plazas um, to just not block the thing. Um, uh, and I, I know that those are moving forward as well as you know a lot of rebranding and wayfinding and um, like an education campaign kind of. Thing. I, I don't know if that sort of temporary education campaign is moving forward a lot. Oh, or okay. not. I really like that one as well. Um, Me too. I think that was my favorite idea that we had. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know that it's necessarily dead. I think this is very much a let's try some of these things and see what happens, and um, we can readjust if it's not having the impact that we like. Okay. Um, We are like two weeks away from creek season. I would say this week's season. Started today. One week away. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We are I in drug season. It was this week. Yeah. people on the creek today? Yeah, yeah. 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 there were such a good It was actually two birds today? Yeah. So cool. Yeah. It was warm enough, yeah. a bit warmer today. So. Uh, well, outside. It's going to be in the mid 80s all weekend on Memorial Weekend. Oh, so that's true. Really this weekend is going to be impactful. So, all these changes should be very quick on the hills. go on a little field trip to see to see if it feels different than last year. Well, I give us some time to implement. We're okay. Not, we're not there yet. Okay, it, it hasn't been implemented. We should definitely do that again. We should. Yeah, we should go out for a walk together. On a weekend. And see on, if on the a changes are working. Day and, and see how it's working. And we can, you know. If it can stay together, because we'll be bumped away from it. Well, I don't think we'll have just, a rope. Like yeah, we'll just tether ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, well, yeah, yeah, we'll with some yeah. 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 <laughs> Well, we end at the mill for beer. Yeah, yeah it was yeah. last time we did it was, it was great fun. fun. Yeah. Well, okay, no. Um so yeah, that's that's definitely happening. Other okay. questions? Well the, I wanna say that I like the way you guys have to work. I mean, you know, my first feels good. I, I, I think we've all kind of unspoken. We, we never really had a discussion of how informal we are compared to other boards, but I think we've all just appreciated that this feels more like just a conversation than um, any real um, legislative process. Uh, it tends to work for us, and it has to date. Um, there have been times when we've had to be a little more formal. Um, mm -hmm. I, you guys sat up there on a day that I had to make a speech. What was what was that? Me a couple of them that I had to make. Oh, 
close the bridge. Um, on oh, yes. 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 And we had a line of people wanting to talk during public then, comments. So we all yeah. wore our hang tags. Yeah. We sat up there. It was very cute. It didn't materialize, though, right? Like, <laughs> everybody, it was, we thought that it was going to be the state leaders, and I think city council showed up, and that was mm -hmm. Yeah, we had a few people, though. Mm -hmm. Were there? Okay. And, and the other time was the 8th Street, when we had sort of a preliminary plan. Yeah. And we had a number of people. Yep. Uh, come and talk that, of course, people go, you know, people drive 60 miles an hour down that street mm -hmm. in spite of what their cameras, you know, or what the, data the speed data shows us, you know, yeah. it, it, they're just not right. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, people parking everywhere, and I mean, I don't disagree. It was about the time we had the neighborhoods with the parking up, up near the on Gulch parking area where the streets were so narrow and oh, yeah. they wanted to reduce. Yeah, yeah, that's a big it. one. Yeah, we had a bunch oh, of people show up. So we had a bunch of public comments coming in. Did we look at the garage? The garage that was going to, uh, people owned, the, the house sits on mm -hmm. east, but they wanted to build their garage so they could drive in mm -hmm. off Vernon. Mm -hmm. yeah. Table, not east, but yes, yes, yeah. that, was, that was the issue. And that project yeah. has been it's done. done. Yeah, yeah. I, I drove by it, and I don't see that it's a problem with, uh, in any it's way. Not. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have some interesting to... things. <laughs> uh, Dixie's our chair, right? Who's yeah. our co-chair? I thought it was. Oh, it's Eric. Okay, I thought for a minute maybe it was Brian. All good. All good. We can we can discuss if it's time to change. Yes. Musical chairs of the chair. Mm -hmm. um, Why don't we do that next I, time? Yeah, we, we can sure. service, we should schedule some time. Um, anybody who wants it can get up and give an impassioned speech and <laughs> re vote and figure it out. Um, but I don't, I, I, it's not that it's not, it, it's working, yeah. so I, uh, I, I, I'm I, a firm believer of if it ain't broke. Um, I've been mm -hmm. chair long enough. All right. I think Eric should be chair. Yeah, well, be chair. I was actually considering stepping down from vice chair just because of my travel schedule. It's not a problem for the meetings I can schedule around, but I'm a little worried, you know, some of the different community meetings and stuff we've had to do lately, those are a little more You've done more of those problematic than, than with, I have. with my travel, and that worries me that I wouldn't, wouldn't be able to do that. So I'm not saying that's the case, but it's, that's where you have I've been vice thinking chair about it. Who helps pick, pick up the slack. <laughs> you did a lot of that because I, uh, there's, so I could have done well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everyone's got their own. Mr. Person, <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I will schedule some time at next meeting to discuss just that. We'll also probably have, yeah, we'll have the 20 and 20 um, discussion. So I've got a lot of research to do to kind of gather data and um, especially on experiences. And um, we can talk about that and make a formal recommendation to council on whether we like the idea or not. Cool. Sounds good. In the meantime, let's all root for Steve to go get the money. Yeah. <laughs> no, he is on a mission. Especially that, that traffic signal. So I budgeted yeah. this money, um, 300K, and we've been sitting on it for, well, I budgeted it prior to COVID. We had pause because of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, didn't really have a demand, and it didn't make a lot of sense to go and, and do that. We were pulled in another direction, so I hit pause. We had pause again when Corey Tech came in. It's like, well, we should not make any changes to this until we fully understand what this development is going to do to the downtown traffic. Um, so we had pause on that. Now that that's largely settled from a traffic standpoint, at least the number of standpoint, we're, um, we're full go. And we have Mueller on the case, and they should have, they've already studied it, They're, they should have recommendations on um, technology soon. That. I think it's just roll on the RFP and get going. Well, assuming we can get the mic. Yeah, first let's get the mic. Go see. Because it's really promising, so yeah. No, it doesn't. I, like you said, it, it's not as competitive in that one as some others. Yeah. For like,